Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash UNC knowledge. Twitter.com slash UNC knowledge. Journalist, pundit, and scholar Michael Barone is the senior political analyst for the Washington Examiner, a frequent commentator on Fox News, and a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Mr. Barone is also the principal author and editor of a book that has been published every two years for almost four decades, The Indispensable Almanac of American Politics. Here's the first one, Michael, published in 1971. Well, published late 71. But covering the elections of 1970. Right. And here is the most recent, which says 2010. So the next, you won't, you won't publish a new one until after the The next the one comes out after the uh, 2010 elections. Got it. All right. So today, Michael Barone on four decades of American politics. You were still in your 20s, Michael, when you published this book, when you began work on this book in 1970. What were you thinking? Well, this was uh, almost precisely four decades ago, Peter. I mean, I got started writing in the Almanac of American Politics in June or July of 1970. My co-author, Grant Jafusa, thought up the idea. He's a person I'd known at Harvard. And uh, he chose me for it in part because when we were introduced, we both on the Harvard Crimson, the school newspaper, right. and you ask people where they're from, and he said he was from Worland, Wyoming, and I said, oh yes, that's the western terminus of US 16, as it then was. <laughs> Even then? Even then, you were well, new. And, uh, <laughs> well, nobody at Harvard had heard of Worland, and many people had not heard of Wyoming, so he was impressed with this, and when he had, he had the idea of doing a guidebook for students lobbying against the Cambodia invasion of May 1970. And it quickly became apparent that if we were going to prepare a guidebook about American politics for one group of citizens, might as well prepare it for everybody and provide a lot of information and people you know, can make their own decisions and their own choices. So that was the genesis and it was published finally in November 1971. I thought it would uh, disappear into the pool of American politics, make a couple ripples fall to the bottom of the pond and never be heard of again. And in fact, we've had 20 editions, uh, the one most recently published a little less than a year ago for the 2010 right election. Right, here. right here's the most recent one. All right, segment one, who and where. I will name a major change. This is a, this is a, this is a game show. You've stumbled into this morning, Michael. I'm so going I to get name $64 a, <laughs> if I win. <laughs> I'll give you $64. Uh, I'll name a major change between 1970 and today, and you give me the implications for American politics. Okay. Ethnicity. Michael Barone in 1970, writing in 1970, quote, it is the conviction of the authors that ethnic divisions are likely to correlate with political attitudes, close quote. Explain that to me. Well, it, uh, it's a concept that I got from... Um, my study of American politics going in the 1960s. I mean, I grew up in Detroit in the 1950s, which was uh, Michigan had a kind of classic economic warfare politics, the United Auto Workers Union and union members versus management and farmers out state and so forth. That was the template of the politics. And yet, as I look closer at it, there were other differences that were important. I mean, Catholics tended to vote at that time Democratic, most especially for John Kennedy in 1960, but also in other elections. Protestants tended to be Republicans. If you go back in the history of Michigan, it was settled by people of New England Yankee stock from New England and upstate New York in the 1830s and 40s and was one of the bases of the Republican Party, which was really a creation of what I now call the Yankee diaspora, the New right. England folks spreading across the northern right. edge of the country. and. Uh, you know, I was influenced by a book called The Concept of Jacksonian Democracy by Lee Benson, which I recently re uh, looked at again, which I read in 1965, which made exactly that claim that I thought it was a fallacy that uh, when people, political scientists said, voting is just a function of economics, who gets what and how much. It seemed to me other issues were at stake and that Although economic issues and economic status definitely play some role in American politics and American electoral choices over our many years now, um, divisions like ethnic politics and today I would say cultural politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been in this period from, say, 1995 to 2005 where the biggest, the, the, the demographic variable most highly correlated with voting behavior was religion or right. degree of religiosity within, you know, each sectarian group. 
with the more religious being more Republican, the less religious being more Democratic. Let's, let's stay on ethnicity for just a moment. Let me, let me give, let's just give you a couple data points here. The United States in 1970, population 203 million. African Americans, 11 percent. United States today, population 310 million. African Americans, 13 percent. 1970, Hispanics, 4.5 percent. Today, 13 percent. Asians in 1970, 1 percent. Today, 4 percent. Everyone else in 1970, almost 84 percent. Everyone else today, 70 percent. Well, of course, we're using the ethnic uh, and racial categories and constructs that have been developed right around 1970. The Hispanic court uh, category was introduced in the U.S. Census in 1970. And if you go back to the data in 1970, 1970 was the lowest point uh, of immigration, of immigrants as a percentage of total population in American history from about the 1850s until the present day because we'd had restrictive immigration the laws passed in the 1920s. Right? There was little immigration during the Depression and World War II uh, and so forth. So it was a low point and w what we've done now is we've returned partway toward in the last 40 years towards the high levels of immigration uh, that existed a hundred years ago. Uh, in fact, you know, the immigrant uh, inflow as a percentage of total population was only about one-third of what it was in, this, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the first decade of the 20th century. Uh, but it's something that uh, very few people analyzed very much. I think in that first edition of the Almanac of American Politics, when I was talking about ethnicity, I was talking about Irish. Italians, yes, yes, that's what Poles, you were talking about within the Jews, everyone else category. And so right. forth. Yes, yes, and that right. was the census. The census then tracked people by um, did, were you born in another country or were your parents born in another country? So you had uh, categories that you had to interpret. The Russian category, for example, there were two groups that came out heavily Russian. Uh, Eastern European Jews, whose parents were born in the Russian Empire, right. were still alive, and the children were still alive and well in the 1970 census. Uh, and Volga Germans in North Dakota. These are Germans that emigrated to the Russian Empire in the 18th century, and then they went to the similar climate, yes. North Dakota. <laughs> they know how to pick them. Around 1900. Right. Uh, regional shifts. Michael Barone in 1970 again, quote, each state has its own political flavor, an ambience about its politicians and the voting behavior of its residents that is not found elsewhere. Again, a handful of figures. 1970, California, our beloved golden state where we sit right now, claimed 38 seats in the House of Representatives. Today, 53. Florida in 1970, 12 seats. Today, 25. New York in 1970, 41 seats in the House of Representatives. New York today, 29. Shifts from here to here, implications for American politics? Uh, well, one of the reasons for that big shift has been uh, comparative tax policies in the states. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, if you compare New York, for example, with Texas, which had no, uh, uh, which has no state income tax. New York has plenty of income taxes, in states, cities, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in in 1970, uh, uh, New York had 18 million people. Today, 40 years later, 19 million people. Not very much growth. Uh, and, of course, a lot of people, le Americans leaving and immigrants coming in. Uh, Texas in 1970 had 11 million people. Now it has 24 million people. A lot of immigrants have come there, but a lot of people from the, more people from the other parts of America have moved there. It's been a more dynamic economy. I think the politicians, at least the liberal politicians circa 1970, thought, well, it doesn't matter how much tax burden you put on a state. I mean, Nelson Rockefeller was then the governor of New York. Uh, the saying was that he spent the public's money as if it was his own. And <laughs> the, I'd never heard that one. <laughs> and uh, raised taxes had by far the most generous Medicaid program had been enacted. Uh, and that turned out to be a, have a terrible parasitic influence on New York's private sector economy. I mean, you go to upstate New York today, uh, and it's a ghost oh, town aside from you know, government and hospitals, and that's about, and historic right. sites. It was right. once one of the most dynamic parts of the American economy. Now it's a basket case. It's a tragic story, really. Uh, most people didn't anticipate that in 1970. They thought, well, you can throw any amount of taxes on there. It won't make much difference because people have to be in New York, and they won't like Texas because it's hot there in the summer. Well, they failed to understand economic incentives, and they failed to understand air conditioning. Air conditioning. Segment two, you've, you've set this one up already. I, I'd like to sort of talk about two triumphs, or at least pose to you two triumphs and see what you make of them. 
One is economics, and the notion, my underlying suggestion to you, we'll see what you make of it, is that the difference in politics between 1970 and today suggests we've actually gotten someplace. We've learned a few things. Tax rates may be one. 1970, marginal income tax rates remained almost as high as they were during the Second World War, top rate over 70 percent. Today, Republicans and Democrats are li alike are arguing about whether the top rate should be permitted to rise from 35 to a little under 40 percent. 1971, Richard Nixon said, we're all Keynesians now. Today, the chairman of the Fed, Ben Bernanke, is an avowed disciple of Milton Friedman. Can it be said that it, within the field of economics, conservatism triumphed? I think that's right. I mean, if you go to universities, the one department that has moved to the right politically in a perceptible way over the last 40 years has been the economics department, so the influence of Milton Friedman. Is, uh, it was very important there, free market economics. It's also the, the, the experiences that we've gone through. I mean, 1970 turned out to be sort of the tag end of a period of what I call big unit government that got going in World War II, where, you know, we won World War II in part because big government worked with big business right. and big labor. This was Franklin Roosevelt's uh, thing. Unlike Woodrow Wilson, he didn't nationalize the war industries. He made deals with the unions. And the idea was that a few people running these big institutions could make decisions and everything would work out better for everybody. And for about a generation, that seemed to work. By 1970, it was flagging. We were headed for a period of stagflation, of inflation with uh, low or no economic growth, which the regnant economists of the time said couldn't happen, but it did. Uh, and basically, we moved away from that uh, towards more market-oriented policies, the Reagan tax cuts being a major advance in public policy, but also on the deregulation front. Mm -hmm. The New Deal in the 1930s basically said, we want to freeze prices at their current level. We don't want them to drop. We want to protect current producers, current incumbents in the economic markets. We want to protect truckers and railroads and airlines from uh, any comp and telephone companies from any competition. And around 1970, we started getting movement towards deregulation. Uh, Free market economists and Republicans played a good role in that, but so interestingly did Ralph Nader, who campaigned against the Interstate Commerce Commission's uh, railroad price, freight price settings, said mm -hmm. you should actually have competition. Edward Kennedy and Jimmy Carter played significant parts in deregulating airlines and, uh, and trucking industries. Right. And basically what we did by deregulation of transportation and communication is we squeezed huge amounts of cost out of the system. And that made goods and services available to ordinary people for much lower percentages of their incomes. Let me, let me, here's it, here's it. To me, this was very striking. Per capita GDP, uh, I'm giving you figures that are fixed in $2,005, so the figures are comparable. Per capita GDP, when you, when this book came out, $20,786. Per capita GDP, when this book came out, $41,646 per person during the period you've been editing the almanac of American politics, the wealth that the American economy produces each year has almost doubled. What does that mean for American politics? That we, have, we started as the richest nation in the world and we've become much richer. Uh, well, I think it's, uh, over time, it has changed us from um, a, a class of people who were arguably looking for benefits from the government. Uh, to people who have um, become, uh, in effect, property holders, property owners. Uh, we've become, once again, a property-owning democracy, as we were, a representative democracy, as we were in the early 19th century, when the generation that followed the founders started extending the vote to everybody because, hey, everybody owned some land. Everybody was an owner. Everybody had a stake in society. You could trust uh, people with a pro own property, with a stake in society, to avoid ruinous confiscatory legislation. And, um, you know, the progressives of the early 20th century, the New Dealers, were dealing with a population where most people didn't have significant property, where mm. city dwellers did not own their houses on average, uh, where they did not accumulate substantial financial assets. We had this sort of proletariat. That gives us the New Deal public policies and so forth and the idea that you needed to uh, spread the wealth around, to use Barack Obama's term, to Joe the plumber. I think that we've come uh, to a different place in, uh, and that we were coming there in the 1970s, certainly in the 1980s, when uh, 
we don't want. Uh, we don't see government increasingly as, you know, a source to plunder the rest of the economy, to you know, spread the wealth around from uh, Joe the plumber to somebody purportedly more deserving. Uh, but instead, uh, you know, and despite the current financial problems, I think um, the political response to the Obama administration spread the wealth around programs, the very negative response, has indicated that uh, that this is a property owner's republic that uh, doesn't favor redistribution. In at least that regard, Tocqueville would have recognized America today more readily than he would have recognized America in 1932. Uh, I've made that argument. I mean, in the Almanac of American Politics 1996 that followed the Republican uh, uh, victory in the 1994 elections. I talked about uh, Alexis de Tocqueville's America. I said we had to look back in history and look beyond Al D'Amato to Al de Tocqueville. And, uh, and, and basically that, uh, that we were once again a property-owning republic, that we were ones which uh, people uh, who again had you know, numerous voluntary associations. Uh, we are, as American Enterprise Institute President Arthur Brooks said, you know, the most charitable people in the world. We, we fund and volunteer our time in all sorts of private voluntary associations. Tocqueville saw this in the 1830s. It is, continues to be true in America today. Segment three, Michael. We just talked about a conservative economic triumph. Let me suggest a liberal triumph. Um, social indicators. Uh, white children born out of wedlock in 1970, 5.7%. Today, 28.5%. African American children born out of wedlock in 1970, 37.6% percent today. 68.2%. Abortions per thousand women of childbearing age in 1974.5, today 19.4. So something happened. The sexual revolution got made permanent, institutionalized. Uh, well, Pat Moynihan warned us about this in 1965 when he was an assistant secretary of labor of the problem of the black Negro family, as he said, in right, the locution right. of the time. And, uh, of course, he turned out to be very uh, uh, prescient. Uh, the figures he pointed to with alarm, the percentage of unwed births among blacks, American blacks at that time, is now the figure for the population as a whole. Uh, and so we have gone through a cultural change in a lot of ways. I think one way to describe it is to say that the attitudes of sort of the counterculture of the 60s, we can have sex before we get married. Having kids out of wedlock is not harmful. They don't really need two parents, a mom and a dad, uh, and so forth. Those have spread to, the, spread to the wider society in the 70s. What's happened since then is that we've seen a modulation of some of these data. Abortion rates are actually down some. Abortion of the last rates five or six have years. been declining. Well, even, even for longer than that? Long since the early 1990s, abortion mm -hmm. rates have been declining, and attitudes towards abortion among under 30 Americans today are more negative than those among of, of over 30 By the Americans. Way, I checked the divorce rate in 1970 versus today. Absolutely unchanged. That's one thing that hasn't moved at all. Yeah, one of the things that's happened is that uh, sort of the upper half of the population, if you're looking at, you know, degree of education, economic status, um, is behaving, uh, is, not, uh, is not divorcing much, is not having ch children brought up uh, by w single parents, it's not having many unwed births. It's the lower half of the population, and basically... Uh, I think when I'm in kind of a melancholy mood that the uh, rich and pampered kids of the 1960s and their values, and I suppose I might include my own, uh, have spread to people who can't afford those kind of behaviors. Uh, if you're rich and get divorced, you, you can have your children raised by nannies, you can do this, that, or the other thing. You've got a lot of fallback positions. You've got a lot of guardrails. Uh, for people who come from more modest backgrounds, the guardrails aren't there, and some of them fall off the highway, and uh, I think that's one of the problems in our society today. You don't hear people celebrating as much anymore the idea that, well, one parent is just fine and kids won't have any problems, because the data is so overwhelming uh, that this creates a lot of problems for a lot of kids when they grow up and become adolescents and adults. Uh, more on the question of the liberal influence over these last 40 years. Total federal spending as a proportion of GDP in 1970, 19.3%. Today, 28.1%. Federal deficit as a proportion of GDP in 1970. Get ready for this. 
0.27%. Today, 28.1%. It's almost the same figure with the decimal point moved two places. Um, between 1970 and today, defense spending as a proportion of GDP and entitlement spending have swapped places. Defense spending used to be about uh, 8%, now it's under 4 Entitlement spending used to be about 4%, and now it's almost 10%. So what does this suggest? You've uh, been largely, 40 years, you've been largely celebratory in your introductory essays <laughs> about American politics, but doesn't this suggest a failure? Uh, well, I think it suggests, it suggests a couple of things. Um, you have, uh, you know, you pointed to the deficit. A lot of the, the deficit increase and spending increase has been the last couple of years. Either one year jump. Uh, well, some of, it's right. some of it's attributable to the TARP bailout and things that happened uh, while well, George W. Bush, in the last year of George W. Bush's presidency, even more is attributable to the Obama administration policies, which seem to be very unpopular with voters and uh, perhaps may be reversed uh, if the public gets its way. We'll see what happens in subsequent elections. Um, I think what, uh, you know, the fascinating thing that you point out is the swapping of defense and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and entitlements. I mean, I remember, you know, I've got relatives now that are still saying, well, the defense, well, the Pentagon takes up half the budget. Well, that was a mantra from the early 1960s when it did. It doesn't anymore. We're, we have, uh, you know, we spend about half the money on defense in the whole world, and we do so as a percentage of GDP that's less than half of the Reagan peacetime 1980s. Right. And, you know, it was even higher in the 19, early 1960s peacetime. So, uh, we're able to do that. I think on entitlements, uh, we have become kind of an indulgent nation, and we have kept in place policies which perhaps made sense uh, with the demo demographics of the past, but don't now. I mean, a key point was 1972. Richard Nixon and Wilbur Mills, both running for the presidency. Mills was the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee and ran it with an iron hand. Uh, and they made a huge increase in Social Security benefits at that time. And in fact, they put in double COLAs, the cost of living adjustment. They actually uh, misdrafted the bill, which caused a bunch of problems because inflation then went way up in the 70s, so the program ballooned even more. And, you know, when you ask people, um, what are the, you know, what were the demographic assumptions behind this? Who was going to pay for it? Uh, the answer that came back from some of the Social Security architects, well, the baby boom generation of children are going to produce another baby boom of their own. They're going to have four or five kids, too, just like their parents did. And those kids' Social Security taxes will pay for these benefits. And if you said to them, well, actually, the baby boom generation uh, has had lower birth rates, you know, starting off. If, you know, they're 26 years old, some of them at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, they said, well, they're just delaying childbirth and they'll have all those kids later. Uh, well, as we've learned throughout history, uh, the behavior of one generation does not necessarily the same as the generation before it. Uh, people are subject to different influences. The culture changes. The history changes. Macro events like wars intervene. Uh, and, and people behave differently. And we did not see a replication of the baby boom. So the demographic assumption of that big increase in Social Security uh, never went into play. Uh, we had some changes in the program bipartisan basis in 1983. Uh, it's obvious that we need some additional changes now, uh, but we haven't been able to do that. Uh, you know, we still have uh, age 65, 66 retirement. Uh, is the sort of standard retirement age. And in practice, many people take early retirement, so the average retirement age on Social Security is something like 63. And people are living to, you know, the 63-year-old can expect to live to about 85 or 86. Uh, when Social Security was enacted in 1935, most adult males were dead before they were 65. Right. Promising to pay the money at 65 wasn't a very expensive promise. It's pretty expensive so today. Michael, uh, to quote Herb Stein, if something can't go on forever, it won't. How will the political, we know this can't go on forever. We know that entitlement spending is unsustainable. What will happen? How will the political system grapple with the unsustainability of it? Well, I think a couple, in a couple, couple of different ways. I mean, I think there are some fairly easy solutions to Social Security. As, uh, as George Rob W. Bush tried to persuade and got no traction even within his own party during the first couple of years of his second term. Yeah, it, but I think basically uh, you've got, you know, the Posen plan to change uh, from wage indexing to 
uh, inflation indexing for benefit structure of future beneficiaries uh, with a sliding scale so that you cut the benefits of the affluent more than and you don't cut the benefits of those at the lowest end of the economy. That has something for both political parties. Mm -hmm. uh, it saves a lot of money. Uh, it continues to provide it as good a safety net for those at the low income levels and frankly those at the high, high earners aren't depending on Social Security for any major part of their retirement income. Um, and what I'm trying, I'm, you who love American politics so much, I'm trying to push a little bit to see if you, if I can get you to say, you know, at least as regards to entitlement spending, the system is broken. It's just not working very well. I can't get you to say that. Uh, I think it's not working very well. I think that on health care, we've seen a monopartisan solution imposed by the Democratic Party in the last year, which exacerbates uh, the, sing the single worst defining characteristic of our health care finance system, which is the... Cost. Well, it's quite, but it's the uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the the preference for employer provided health insurance. This mm -hmm. distorts mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, system in all kinds of ways. And you had a proposal on the table from uh, uh, Democrat Ron Wyden, a Republican Bob Bennett, members of the Senate Finance Committee, to uh, eliminate that preference, which was a fairly responsible proposal. And I'm disappointed that the Obama administration. Uh, when it first started considering, you know, saying we, we're going to have a health care bill, uh, didn't come forward with some variation on Wyden Bennett because the preference for employer provided uh, health insurance is just not defensible as public policy. This was an artifact of World War II when uh, employers were competing for scarce labor. They'd say, we'll pay you the health care. And the Roosevelt administration said, okay, we won't count that as income. And then, you know. And it got frozen in. It got frozen in. Uh, it's an artifact of a period when we had wage and price controls as a wartime temporary measure. That's no basis for a permanent public policy. And yet 60 seven plus years. Yeah, yeah. Seven decades later, we're still stuck with it. Segment four, Beyond the Water's Edge. Richard Nixon. Address to the Nation, April 30th, 1970. This is a couple months before you began working on this book. Quote, tonight, American and South Vietnamese units will attack the headquarters for the entire communist military operation in South Vietnam. Close quote. President Barack Obama addressed at the United States Military Academy, December 1st, 2009, when you were working on this edition of the Amer Almanac of American Politics. Quote, I have determined that it is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 troops to Afghanistan, close quote. From the Cold War to the War on Terror, what has that meant for American politics? Uh, well, when, in 1970, when I was writing this book, we really, uh, America had emerged out of the Cold War consensus and into Cold War contention, if you will. I mean, the first 20 years of the Cold War, say from 1947 to 67, you had pretty much a bipartisan consensus. You had some Republicans, Senator Robert Taft voted against the NATO treaty, for example. That's why Dwight, General Dwight Eisenhower ran against him for the nomination. He wanted to preserve the European alliance. But there was pretty much a consensus. And then during the Vietnam War, you get the emergence of an anti-war movement. Uh, interestingly, it has started against the policy of a Democratic president, but the Democratic politicians don't embrace it until we get a Republican president, Richard Nixon. Uh, and then it becomes Nixon's war, and we have a partisan uh, set of tilt to it. How did that happen from John Kennedy, who ran to the right of Richard Nixon on defense policy, uh, accusing yeah, Nixon and the Eisenhower of the missile gap, from John Kennedy in 1960 to George McGovern just a dozen years later? I think a key thing in that, um, and I'm not sure I ever wrote about it in the Almanac, is, uh, is, the, is the draft policy and the retention of the um, World War II era, actually, or post-war era, uh, deferments for college students and so forth. This was a war in which the decision makers did not think it was worthwhile to send their sons to fight. And you get two responses from that. You get from the, those, the class of people whose sons went to fight, you get a sort of disillusionment with it. Uh, and they the, feel tainted. They feel guilty. They know what's going on. And from that sort of upper the class, upper the college class, class people, uh, the sons feel a need to justify themselves. And they start you know, basically thinking, um, this is not a country worth fighting for. And that attitude infects the college-educated, you know, elite university, educated elite, and, and affects it to the present day to some extent. 
some lingering extent. Uh, and you get, you get an upper class with sort of an adversary attitude towards America's policy in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, 1970 uh, was about the beginning of that period. Let me ask you to explain another transition within a party. 1970, the Republican Party is still dominated by the Northeast, by moderates or liberals. Richard Nixon, well, Nixon, of course, is a Californian. He was his a Nick, New York voter when he was New elected voter, president that's right. in 68. He, he thinks New York is where the action is, and in those days, in some ways, he's right. Nelson Rockefeller of New York, uh, William Scranton of Pennsylvania, you get a toughness toward the Soviet Union, but also a kind of eagerness to engage in detente. By 1980, I'm asking with regard to foreign affairs here, by 1980, the Republican Party is the party of Reagan. How did that happen? Well, I think... Part of it is the answer I gave to the previous question. Those, that, the East Coast elites became Democrats. I mean, uh, J. Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller IV was um, offered when Robert Kennedy was assassinated and Nelson Rockefeller as governor of New York would appoint a successor. He called his nephew Jay and said, you want to be a senator? I'll I appoint. That. Is that well known? I believe oh. that's known, oh, yeah. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll appoint you a senator as a Republican. And Jay said, no, I want to be a Democrat. He was down in West Virginia. Uh, doing anti-poverty work, running for Secretary of State of West Virginia, and uh, and so forth. So that that generation, that that sort of group, the Bushes were unusual. But remember that George H. W. Bush had moved off to Texas. So he got out of the whole 19, scene in 1946, and he moved to the area that turned out to be where the Republican Party would be on the rise, and left the area of the Northeast where the Republican Party would be on the decline. Uh, so I think that's one element. The other element is the demographic uh, variables. I mean, if you go back to the 1930s and 40s, New York had 45 congressional districts. Pennsylvania had 33. Um, the next highest state was down about 18 or 17 or something. These were, or Illinois was in the low 20s. So, you know, that, those, were the base, the, those were the base for the East Coast Republicans and the people that nominated Wendell Wilkie, Thomas Dewey, Dwight Eisenhower, Richard Nixon. Um, you know, population and political power shifts to the Californias, the Texas, and the South, which had been solidly uh, Democratic and whose politicians had been supporters of or hostages to, at least, the policy of racial segregation suddenly becomes Republican and is no longer weighed down with that issue of racial segregation but because with the success of the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 65, you have a negligible percentage of Americans who want to bring back legally enforced racial segregation. So the South becomes part of the Union and it becomes first at the presidential level and then by the 1990s at the congressional level a Republican region. Uh, let me ask you one last question about foreign policy. Barack Obama sends 30,000 additional troops to Afghanistan. By the time he steps down, will we have achieved a kind of bipartisan consensus in the war on terror, like the one in the Cold War? Uh, I, I'm not sure we will. I note that uh, quite a few Democratic members of Congress now are opposing President Obama on his Afghanistan policy, or at least casting votes that are highly critical of it. And uh, I see something that looks a little bit like the Democratic opposition to Lyndon Johnson. Uh, in the late years of his administration on the Vietnam War, a kind of a mm -hmm. peace party. It's uh, peace Nick, the term Time magazine used in the 1960s, early 60s when it was a liberal Republican publication. Um, and so I do see a split there. I think there's, uh, I think there's a large part, of, not perhaps a majority, but a large part of the Democratic Party, both its politicians and its constituencies, who basically don't feel this is a very good country that uh, we're often wrong in the world, that we are as uh, affluent, mostly white people, oppressors uh, in the world, and that military action by the United States is a bad thing. Uh, and I think that segment of the electorate uh, is important. I think on some issues, Barack Obama seems to share those views. On Iraq and Afghanistan, he seemed to share, the, he seemed to share those views on Iraq as a senator. He is not as a president. Uh, he seemed to, he, you know, he did, has not shared those views on Afghanistan, but uh, I think that's a part of the American electorate that is significant, that was dormant during the period 1947 to 67, the period of Cold War consensus. Mm -hmm. 
that was a major force in the Democratic Party in the second half of the Cold War, let's say 1947 to 89. It was the kind of people that didn't like hearing a phrase, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Uh, and uh, it's... It's uh, He's still there. It's still part of our uh, uh, thing. And in fact, if you go before the year, years of World War II, there was a kind of left-wing isolationism that was a part of the country too. So that Cold War consensus, which you know, many, peop many people look back on as, hey, that was the Those period the when America War. was America, may have been the anomaly. Right. You go back to World War I, there were 56 members of the House and I think a dozen senators who voted against the declaration of war in World War I. That's a significant percentage of the, pub of the Congress. Segment five, our final segment, points of inflection. Michael Barone in 2010. Quote, to uh -oh. oversimplify, <laughs> comma, to oversimplify, then you make a wonderful point. The economic distress of the 1930s convinced most Americans that markets didn't work very well and that government did. The economic distress of the 1970s convinced most Americans that government didn't work very well and that markets did. In this view, the 1930s produced a natural democratic majority for a long generation and the 1970s produced a natural Republican majority for a long generation. It may be time for another inflection point." Close quote. Is it? Um, turns out not, um, I think. And I think we can say that pretty conclusively. I mean... The, oh, really? Okay, good. The Lay polling, out the case. Well, this in that introduction of the Almanac of American Politics, which in 2010, which I was writing in the spring of 2009, um, I, you know, I feel an obligation in this book to present all the descriptions of members of Congress in neutral tones, to talk about pub issues in neutral terms. I don't want to use the term reform for any position. Let's have a more neutral term rather than one that seems to indicate approval. And I wanted to give, you know, a fair hearing to the idea that the Obama administration, and Barack Obama got a higher percentage of the vote than any other Democratic nominee in history except Andrew Jackson, Franklin Roosevelt, and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, might be part of a permanent running majority, as James Carville and others have been predicting. Uh, and I think what's happened is that the Obama Democrats' assumption that economic distress would make Americans more supportive of or amenable to big government programs has pretty clearly turned out to be wrong. I mean, we've been faced with a big expansion of government in health care and the stimulus package and all sorts of domestic programs and running the auto companies, bank, and so forth. Uh, financial regulation and uh, and voters have really uh, been against these policies pretty strongly. In the uh, in the election in November, the Obama Pelosi Reid impulse to expand the state will be a counterbalanced or b repudiated. Counterbalanced, and we'll see how effective uh, Republicans are. I mean, some uh, Democrats and perhaps some commentators who are not Democrats are saying, well, look, once the if the Republicans get in and start cutting things, that will be terribly unpopular. I'm inclined to disagree with that, but I don't feel sure that that's mm -hmm. the case, you know. And the Democrats are out attacking Paul Ryan's roadmap, which is a, uh, a set of proposals to reduce the growth of entitlements and to get you know the federal budget into balancing over the very over the long term of the several decade type period uh, the Democrats apparently feel that those proposals might prove to be unpopular if um, and, and a lot of Republicans have been wary but you are about against embracing, your own instincts now aren't you uh, embracing it if I had to bet a thousand dollars I would bet that the cuts tend to be popular I, I, I look at the UK where cuts are popular I look at Governor Mitch Daniels of, uh, of Indiana, who won re-election in, in 2008, state that Barack Obama was carrying, with a turnout that was favorable to Obama, with a lot of young people, black voters, newly entering the electorate to vote Democratic. Mitch Daniels won 58 to 40. He got a higher percentage in the state's most affluent county than Ronald Reagan did in 1984. He carried 25 percent of votes among blacks and 37 percent among Latinos. He won young voters 51 to 42. Um, after a four-year period of sort of skinflint government. Uh, that says to me, that's fragmentary evidence, perhaps, but evidence that uh, a serious um, public policy of reducing government expenditure and employment, of uh, changing the delivery of public services in important ways, 
uh, can prove to be uh, popular and effective uh, and among an electorate that was voting that same day for Barack Obama. Last question, large question, Michael. <clears throat> essay question. Henry Luce published a famous essay in 1941 entitled The American Century. Bear that title in mind as I quote you to yourself one more time. Uh -oh. This is Michael Barone writing in 2010. Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan both seemed to turn the economy around. They led the nation to magnificent victories over Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Today, it is possible to imagine that the American economy, economy may recover sharply. It is much more difficult to imagine how the United States can emerge as brilliantly successful against the Islamist terrorists and the Iranian mullahs who wish our destruction." Close quote. The 21st century will not be a second American century? Well, I think, we, I think, I think it will be a second American century. I, in the introduction to my 1990 almanac of American politics, I, called, I, I, I entitled that the American Half Century, and I played off Henry Luce's 1941 um, American Century editorial, which is actually very similar to the liberal Democratic Vice President Henry Wallace's Century of the Common Man. As Luce pointed out, their ideas were sort of similar, that America was going to lead. America had an obligation to lead the world towards democracy, towards freedom, towards prosperity through some combination of market capitalism and safety net provisions. And that uh, you, the, Luce wasn't so much predicting as urging his fellow citizens to support. This was before American entry into World War II. Uh, and I think we, this century, this half, first half century of the 21st century can be uh, a second half of the American century, if you will. But that's an elegiac tone on which you, you close this quote, this, the introduction to this 2010 edition of the Almanac. I think, I think one of the problems is, is that, uh, you know, this is a war in which, as both Presidents Bush and Obama have said, uh, it's hard to determine exactly what victory is. There's not a moment of surrender on the USS Missouri. Uh, there's not a moment like when the first President Bush met Gorbachev on Governor's Island and, uh, and it was great Bush and Ra Reagan and Bush and so forth, Governor's Island with the World Trade Center and Wall Street in the background and sort of... Capitalism won. December 88, this was before the fall of the wall, but obviously anticipated it that, that capitalism had won. That's the scene at which I end my book, um, Our Country, The Shaping of America from Roosevelt to Reagan. Um, you know, those were dramatic moments. Uh, I don't think we see, you know, it's not the same kind of enemy, it's not the same kind of struggle. And, uh, you know, absent, um, you know, a conversion by Osama bin Laden, uh, we're not going to see the same kind of uh, the same kind of inspirational ending. Last question, and this is a question I have to slip in because I just can't not ask the question. Do Republicans in November recapture control of the House of Representatives? And as some are beginning to wonder, the Senate. Uh, probably the House, probably not the Senate, but you never have control of the Senate. You might have a majority. <laughs> All right. Michael Barone, editor for four decades now. Published in 1972, published in 2000, published in 1972, but covering 1970, published in 2010, of the Almanac of American Politics. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us.